A few weeks ago, um, our, our, the, the, the words we were exploring and the idea we were exploring was the idea of radical inclusion. And Glenn preached and I led that service and we explored the many ways that uh, we want to be like Jesus and include people who perhaps are not like us. We talked about people who are from different ethnic backgrounds, people who think differently, vote differently, live their lives differently. And we're, we're really seeking to be a church that is well, not just welcoming at the door, but inclusive of people who, who, are, who are here with us. And one of the things that I named as ways we could include was I named that we used to have a strong Sunday school and we used to be inclusive of all ages and we were ready for little kids and children. And I read a, uh, not a Bible story, I read a, a children's book that I used to read to my own children I, and I could probably do off by, you know, off by heart because I read it so many times. And it was about um, including Elmer the elephant who was a rainbow elephant and um, all the other elephants were grey and El that was Elmer's gift that he was different to the other el elephants. Um, Following that service, uh, we well, it already was happening, but there's been a whole range of intentions to say, even if we don't have children here particularly, we need to be welcoming and ready. So Neri has cleaned up the back area, sorted out the area for people to, for kids to be able to come and make sure that that's a welcoming safe space for little ones. Um, there's a collection of children's books to share and uh, the word has been put out to go in the coming services, whether or not the kids are here, let us be ready and intentionally welcoming as one of the ways that we are trying to be inclusive. So Maria has brought a book today uh, for me to read. It's called Just the Way You Are. I will try and hold it up so you can sort of see the pictures, but you can also just listen to the words. A long time ago, in a land much like your own, there was a village, and the village had five orphans a lonely family of fatherless children, they bonded together against the cold. One day, the king learned of their misfortune and decided to adopt them. He announced he would be their father and he would come for them soon. When the children learned they had a new father and their father was the king and that the king was coming to visit, they went wild with excitement. When the people of the village learned that the children had the father and their father was the king and the king was coming to see them soon, they were excited as well. They went to the children and told them what to do. You need to impress the king. He needs to get gifts. Only those with great gifts will live in the castle. The people didn't know the king, but they thought that's what the king needed to be impressed. So the children began preparing gifts for the king. One of the children knew how to carve and decided to give the king a wonderful work of wooden art. He set his knife against the soft bark of the elm and whittled. The small blocks of wood came alive with the eyes of a sparrow or the nose of a horse. His sister decided to present the king with a painting that captured the beauty of the heavens, a painting worthy to hang in his castle. Another sister chose music as her way to impress the king. For long hours she practiced with her voice and mandolin. Village people would stop at her window and listen as her music took wings and soared. Yet another child set out to turn the king's head with his wisdom. Long hours you would find him with his candle lit and his books open, geography, maths, chemistry. But there was one sister that had nothing to offer. Her hands were clumsy with the knife, her fingers stiff with the brush, and when she opened her mouth to sing, the sound was hoarse, and she wasn't much of a reader. She believed she had no gift. All she had to offer was her heart, for her heart was good. And she spent her time at the city gates. She would earn pennies to buy food, by grooming people's horses, feeding their animals. She was a simple girl, but she had a good heart. She knew people by name, she took time to pet their dogs. She welcomed the strangers. How was your journey? Did you enjoy your new work? Her heart was big and she cared for people. But since the little girl thought she had no gift, she thought the king would be disappointed. She went to her sister. Could you teach me how to carve 
her brother. Teach me how to carve. Sorry, the young craftsman replied without looking up. I've got a lot of work to do. I haven't got time for you. The king's coming, you know. So the little girl put away her knife. She went to her sister. You paint so beautifully. I know, the painter said. Could you share your gift with me? Not now, said the sister with her eye on the palette. The king's coming, you know. And the little girl went away. She went to her sister with the song. She found a crowd of people waiting to see her sister sing. Sister, I've come to listen and learn. But her sister couldn't hear because the noise of the applause was too loud. And with a heavy heart, the girl turned and walked away. She went to her brother, the one that was good with words. I have nothing to offer the king, she said. Can you teach me to read so I might show my wisdom? The young sage-to-be didn't speak. He was lost in thought. The child said, could you help me? Go away, said the scholar, scarcely moving, his, scarcely moving his eyes from the text. Can't you see I'm preparing myself for the coming of the king? And so the girl went away sadly. She had nothing to give. She returned to her place at the gate. And after some days, a man in merchant clothes came to the small town. Could you feed my donkey, he asked. She jumped to her feet and looked at the face of the one who had travelled. His skin leathery from the sun, his eyes were deep, his kind smile warmed the girl's heart. That I can, she said, eagerly taking the animal to the trough. Trust him with me. She said to the donkey, uh, sorry, she said to the man. <laughs> she probably talked to the donkey as well. <laughs> Tell me, she said as the donkey drank, <laughs> have you come to stay? For only a while, I'm looking for someone. Are you weary from your journey? That I am. Would you like to sit and rest? She gave the man a seat and he closed his eyes and he slept. When he awoke, he saw the girl watching him. She was a bit embarrassed that he caught her and she smiled and turned away. Have you been sitting there long? Yes. What do you seek? Nothing. You seem to be a kind man with a peaceful heart. It's good to be near you. The man smiled and stroked his beard. You are a wise girl, he said. When I return, we will visit some more. The man did return quite soon. Did you find the ones you were seeking, the girl asked? I found them, but they were too busy. What do you mean? The first one I came was a woodsmith. He was too busy completing his project. He told me to come back tomorrow. Another was an artist. She was on a hillside, but she did not want to be disturbed. The other was a musician, and I sat and listened to her music. And when I asked to talk with her, she said, I have no time. The other one has gone to the city to go to school. The girl's eyes widened when she realised who the man was. You don't look like a king, she gasped. I try not to, he said. Being a king can be lonely. People are strange around me. They ask for favours, they try to impress me. They bring me all their complaints. But isn't that what a king is for? Asked the girl. Certainly, responded the king. But there are times when I just want to be with my people. There are times when I want to talk to my people, to hear about their day, to laugh a bit, to cry some. There are times when I just want to be their father. Is that why you adopted the children? That's why. Adults think they have to impress me. Children don't. They just want to talk to me. They know that I love them just the way they are. But my brothers and sisters were too busy. They were, but I'll come back and maybe they'll have more time on another day. What about me? I have no gift, but I want to be your child. The king smiled. My dear, you gave the best gift of all. You gave your heart, your kindness, your time, your love. Of course you'll be my child. I love you just the way you are. And so it happened that the children with many talents but no time missed the visit of the king. But the girl with the only gift, which was her heart, became the child of the king. 
Glenn, would you like to come and read today's Bible reading? Thank you. <laughs> it's a beauty, isn't it? <laughs> Glenn's going to read from John chapter 15, verses 1 to 17, which is the passage about the vine. Reading from the New Revised Standard Version. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You've already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified in, by this that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I've called you friends because I've made known to you everything that I've heard from my father. You did not choose me but I chose you, and I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. I'm going to invite Guy up now to share the word with us and his reflections with us. And I know that I've certainly been blessed by, by your preaching and your your messages to us and I said to Guy last week in the last few weeks certainly I've been sitting there and I feel like I'm in a Pentecostal service because I'm mmm yeah and, I, and he said why don't you call it out preach it you know preach it brother so if you get a little bit of preach it brother today you'll, you'll know where that's coming from. <laughs> Thank you Ruth good morning everybody well when it came to uh, choosing this passage it's one of my favorites and I had prepared a sermon, and then I looked at it and I thought, too long, especially because I knew there'd be a few other people wanting to say something this morning, and not only too long, but too boring. So I then reflected back when I was in America doing my training with the Jesuits as a spiritual, for spiritual direction, and I contemplated on this passage three days running, and I pulled out the prayer journal from that time, and I thought, I think this is what I'll share this morning. So what you will hear is first person narrative. It's my conversation with God, and Aidan did that several weeks ago or last year, so I'm in good company. And I will make a few little side comments along the way. You'll have to work out what's from the journal and what's the additional recent edition. But it was a time of sweet consolation, especially in verse nine. Abide in my love. If you've got the NIV, it's remain in my love. I'm particularly attracted to the word abide. After a time of meditation, I pick up a sense of it meaning to dwell and then to be at home. This last few weeks, uh, I've been attending an online seminar by a a Jesuit called Brendan Byrne, who's a New Testament scholar of international renown. And apart from what he had to share in those th three weeks, I did ask him about this because it was on my mind. And I said, Brendan, would it be 
appropriate to translate that phrase abide or remain as be at home in? And he said, certainly. And he's a Greek scholar, so I take him at his word. And he said, in fact, if you look at the Jerusalem Bible, that's how it's translated. So I looked it up and there it was. That's the, the Catholic Bible translated uh, in the post-war period. And one of the translators was J.A.R. Tolkien. And I wonder whether he might have actually selected that particular fra phrase. <coughs> Back to the journal. As I seek where Jesus wants to meet me, I find him at home. We warmly greet and sit down in the family room. At first I feel like a guest. Welcome, but like any guest, there's a degree of being on one's best behaviour and following certain courtesies. For example, you don't just go to the fridge to get what you want and you don't turn on the TV and select your own program to watch Perhaps the host might invite you to do so, but you don't assume. But then Jesus makes clear, I am no guest, but a member of the family, his brother. I feel the freedom of this as I move about my home, our home. I put my feet up with a beer to watch the TV, sitting with Jesus, totally relaxed and at home. Thanks, Brett, if you could put that PowerPoint up. I have investigated AI in this case. I, I thought I would love to get a picture of what I had in my imagination back in 2000. So I wrote a thing out and I had to do it about 10 times to get it right, but it pretty much came up and uh, as soon as Brett's got it up, we'll be able to see it or Jenny will help him find it. I'll, I'll leave you to keep looking, Brett, and you just pop it up when you find it. But anyway, it's not my work, it's an AI work. But this is how I pictured the scene in my imagination. Yes, home is the place where I can be myself. Picks up the theme of the story that we just heard. Where I don't have to put on any fronts or masks. I can be my true self which thrives and enjoys being here with Jesus who loves me as I truly am. And then looking at verse 2, he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that we'll be even more fruitful. Jesus and I go outside into the garden to tend the roses, pruning them, and also seeing the results in a particularly beautiful yellow rose. I can smell its delicate fragrance and appreciate its burgeoning bloom. I pause to savour this for some time. Then I feel moved to write a poem about being at home. And I'll read that to you at the end. Overall, I'm happy just to be at home in this way with my family without any great, great conversation or theological revelations from Jesus, for me, being home with family is the source of pleasure and likewise being at home with Jesus. Indeed, it's my life desire. Verse 11, I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. I sense that joy let our perhaps relaxed contentment, that's a better way of explaining that sense, and delight in the realisation that that is what Jesus refers to. And then verse 12. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. I also realise that this is a place I can invite others. Places have an atmosphere set by the master or host of the home and it communicates itself, in this case, love. Thank you, Jesus, for this most consoling grace. That was the first day. And I contemplated the same passage a second day. I again meet Jesus in our home where we warm, warmly greet each other. 
I notice he is laughing and in a playful and happy mood. And I feel drawn to verse 4, the beginning of verse 4. Abide in me as I abide in you. This is the flip side of yesterday's contemplation when I was so relaxed, being myself, blissfully content and at home in Jesus. Just so, the revelation today is he is at home in me. A mutuality which both delights and amazes me. That he should deign to dwell in me, and not only that, but he's happy to do so. I'm keen to ensure that there's nothing that might interfere with this feeling, his feeling, of being at home in me. And I ask him that he might let me know anything which interferes with his enjoyment. He promises to let me know, though evidently there's nothing to tell me now. I then focus on the second part of verse 7. Ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. At this point in my prayer, I doze off. But even then I realise this is evidence of being at home. That I could do so and Jesus was not perturbed. Indeed, I felt free to do so. And upon awakening, he's still there with me, relaxed and content. Thank you, Lord, for all this relationship means. It looks like I can see the eyes moving, so the picture's up. Not bad, that AI, is it, eh? I'll let you work out which one's supposed to be me, which one's supposed to be Jesus. I think it's fairly obvious. When I, when I was putting this together, every time I did it for the first several times, both of us had a beard. And I kept giving it instructions. No beard on the person on the, you know, the left. And eventually, after a lot of tries, I got the, the picture the way I wanted it. Okay, leave it up there, Brett. The time of prayer seems to conclude. I'm aware of the renewed consolation in this prayer time and thank Jesus for the graces. Then the third day, contemplating again on the same passage. And I reflect especially on verse 13. No one is greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. Yes... Jesus' love and friendship is ultimately shown in his death. But drawing on my previous contemplations in John 15, I realised that love and friendship are also shown in his invitation to be at home in his love and choosing to be at home in me. And verses 14 to 15. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing but I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I've heard from my father. Therefore, I'm to invite others into this love too, into this place that's free and safe where Jesus and I are together where we are at home. And this I realise is my desire. And that friendship is illustrated in that earlier image of me being relaxed and content with Jesus in the family room at home, what you're seeing. A friendship so freeing that I don't need to pretend to be someone else other than whom God has made me to be. And as I sit with that, I reflect... I actually like that person, that true me. Verse 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. To fulfil that goal of fruitfulness, I do need to recognise the pruning process. As challenging as it can be at times, it's a prerequisite. Sometimes it can be so hard and I don't readily foresee the fruit that will follow. But to that end, I can ask anything of the Father in Jesus' name and he will give it. I ponder whether there's anything I should therefore request. For the moment, it's simply to stand against the distractions and persevere in my prayer. Then I realise that in the preceding two chapters, 
chapters 13 and 14. Jesus' commands are not about legalistic rules, but relational ones intended for my growth and fruitfulness. Love from and for him and for others, along with joy and friendship. I spend a short time again contemplating on being at home, being at home with Jesus, but also now welcoming in people to share that place of love and safety, gladly bringing them in to meet with both of us. Yes, Lord, that's what I want to do. And then the poem with which I will finish. Abide in me, says Jesus, yet the words seem stiff with more to yield, so I sit sifting words and seeking images that might convey the truth, the treasure hidden just below the surface. Some digging and the spade strikes home. Home? Ah, home. Be at home in me, says Jesus. Through stirred dust emerges an image. Jesus and I at home together. No guest, however welcome, is fully free in another's home. Only family. Only a brother can, with his elder brother, kick off his shoes, open a beer and watch TV without invitation. Without asking, do you mind if I... We sit there, relaxed, enjoying being together, Jesus and I, but greater still the delight in realising he is at home in me, not a guest for whom I prepare the house, especially putting on my best face. No, just as I am, the real me, loved, free. Amen. I